This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast, not so regular lately, but nevertheless, uh, on 3541 kHz and 1865 kilohertz simulcast AM and uh, also broadcasting by the Melbourne TV repeater, VK3 RTV Digital Channel 1 and streaming live on YouTube channel HD um, and that's about it. So um, uh, the uh, stream, uh, the YouTube stream can be found uh, if you type in VK3CSJ within the YouTube search engine and look for the live symbol and uh, you should be able to quickly find the YouTube stream if you don't have access to the ATV stream live transmission uh, next uh, next Friday there won't be any broadcast um, next Friday and Saturday is the ATV QSO party uh, of which I'll be participating in as well so uh, Friday next week is the ATV QSO party and uh, Friday and Saturday morning uh, we'll be pretty much involved with uh, multiple crosses to uh, various uh, TV stations around the world and uh, uh, you'll be able to view uh, that activity via um, VK3QL. I think um, uh, Ian's going to have a live stream all happening on the YouTube his YouTube stream. So VK3QL uh, will broadcast uh, be broadcasting, as far as I know, the um, live stream f um, continuous uh, uh, for uh, the ATVQ or so party during Friday night, starting from eight o'clock. And, uh, and then Saturday morning from 10 o'clock uh, onwards. Uh, all right, uh, I'll repeat that again uh, towards the, uh, the end of the tonight's uh, broadcast for those latecomers. Anyway, uh, welcome everybody on this uh, 19th of August. And uh, I just want to say that a uh, many heartful thanks to everybody who sent uh, very kind comments and emails uh, during the course of the, the last week or so. Um, as uh, most uh, of, you, uh, of you know, uh, Mum passed away last Thursday. Um, so um, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been a bit of a tough climb. But nevertheless, uh, I do thank everybody for their uh, kind emails uh, that's uh, come through and uh, messages. Thank you very much, Lee. Um, all right, the Astronomical Society of Victoria uh, was founded in 1922. It has well over 1,600 members throughout Victoria and other states of Australia and overseas. Membership of the Society is open to all persons with an interest in astronomy. The Society's objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy, to disseminate the knowledge of the science and to provide greater facilities for the study among its members. Monthly meetings are usually held on the second Wednesday of each month except in January, the latter being held on a Saturday night. Meetings start at 8pm in the Mullia Hall, National Herbarium, um, Burwood Avenue, Melbourne, near the Melbourne Observatory, which is located not too far from the Shrine of Remembrance. Parking is available, Burwood Avenue, Dallas Brooks Drive and the surrounding streets. Admission is free and visitors are most welcome. Privileges of membership include the right to borrow books, periodicals and other publications from the Society's extensive library located at the Melbourne Observatory, receipt of the ASV magazine Crux, which contains articles, news, observing notes and the like, and the free provision of the astronomical yearbook. The Crux magazine is published six times a year, I might add. Access is available to telescopes on members' nights held regularly at the Melbourne Observatory and after the monthly meetings, weather permitting. These instruments include the Society's 300-millimeter 300mm equatorial reflector and a 300mm portable reflector. There's also a 200mm refractor managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens and a photoheliograph are also housed at the observatory and are accessible as well. The Society also has a number of 200mm reflectors available for short period loan to, so newcomers uh, can try before they buy in concept. Regular Society Club Night meetings are held on the first and last Fridays of each month at the Lodge, the Society's property in Burwood. In fact, uh, the uh, the Lodge there at Burwood has now been uh, officially sold, um, so the ASV is now in the realms of trying to find a new place to have our club meetings. So the uh, 
the former lodge at Burwood is uh, is no longer, and uh, very sad to to see uh, the lodge go. Uh, lots of history is uh, in that place. Uh, lots of uh, interesting conversations and discussions and most fascinating section meetings that have been held in that place and uh, very, very sad to see uh, uh, our lodge um, being sold. But we have to move on. That's the thing. The society is growing and we need new digs, as they say. Um, members are also encouraged to make use of the society's country property located near Heathcote, some 90-minute drive north of Melbourne. Uh, there are a range of instruments available for members to use, uh, the larger two only uh, with appropriate training. Um, uh, also located uh, on the site is an 8.5 radio meter radio telescope, which members can access with involvement with the radio astronomy section. Members are encouraged to make and use telescopes. Advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same. Instrument making is only one of the number of common interest activities catered for within the society. Other areas of interest that members can participate in include deep sky observing, astrophotography, lunar and planetary observing, auroral media comet radio observing, <laughs> as in radio astronomy, computing cosmology and astrophysics, historical studies and research and astronomy in general. Contact details for various section directors are provided in the yearbook. Further information may be obtained by visiting the ASV website at www.asv.org.au. Um, and of course, uh, as a supplement to the Crux uh, magazine, uh, there is what's called the Crux Extra Bulletin, which gets, uh, gets published every other week. Um, via email, send out to members via email. So it's just a, a little fill-in uh, between uh, Crux uh, magazine. Please note that the ASV will conform to all elected government health directors. AFC members may be required to be cancelled, moved or postponed. If you wish to write to the ASV, the Secretary, Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001 is the address. Uh, otherwise, um, uh, the ASV website mentioned before, ASV, www.asv.org.au uh, is the website and uh, you can join the society there. There's a membership tag just underneath the, uh, uh, or just above the banner, I think. Um, yes, it's just above the re uh, revolving banner uh, membership in green and it's all via PayPal. So it's uh, easy peasy Japanesey. Uh, all right, um, this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. Um, we also have an email address too, uh, if anybody wishes to send uh, comments uh, uh, via email, I'm watching the inbox as I speak, it's VK3 EKH at Gmail, sorry, VK3 EKH at, yes, gmail.com. And uh, there's also a Discord chat window, which you can uh, find via the ASV website. Again, under the Radio Astronomy tab, look for the um, look, click on Radio Astronomy and uh, look for the ASV Radio Broadcast. Once you click on ASV Radio Broadcast, another page opens and you'll see all the various links to various things. You'll see the YouTube stream there and uh, the Discord uh, channel or the stream is a little radio dish, our, in fact our radio dish, I'm looking at it right now as I speak, but you click on that and you'll find your way there. Uh, okay, um, so yes there is a good aid to John VK3BLX who's joined on the, the chat window and uh, Cassiopeia uh, Nebs, so uh, good day guys. And uh, Mr. Dennis, hey Don, with your email there, um, thank you for the report. Uh, yes, I agree. And uh, 5 or 9 on 80, and uh, 30 over on 160 AM, so that's just lovely. It's the sort of thing I want to hear. <laughs> uh, yeah, all right. We're uh, using a different linear tonight for 80 meters, so um, uh, I haven't quite got the other one fixed yet. You can... If you're watching TV, that big silver thing over on my shoulder here, that's the, the linear I'm working on at the moment. That's what I usually use for 80 metres. Enough of that. Uh, all right. Um, 10 past the hour. 
I'm just going to quickly go through some details on what's current with the with our planets in the sky, courtesy of Jim Catasfolos, a uh, member of the uh, ASV, in the latest crux. Uh, uh, this is the, the late, for those watching TV, YouTube stream, that's the latest crux. You can see there on the screen, nice and shiny publication. Uh, Jim says that for Mercury, if you're interested in knowing what's happening with Mercury, uh, Mercury is in Leo, the constellation Leo, and uh, will put on its best show of the year in August, uh, sitting about 10 degrees above the northwest horizon half an hour after sunset at the beginning of the month. Make sure you have a look on August 4th, been gone I know, uh, when it passes by Regulus with only about one degree between them. The messenger planet will continue to climb higher, reaching its greatest eastern elongation, which is 27 degrees, on the 28th of August and it will be sitting 20 degrees above the horizon half an hour after sunset. It will appear as a 7 arc second half lit 0.4 magnitude waning disk. Uh, as we move into September, good viewing will persist for two more weeks before Mercury will be eventually lost in the sun's glare uh, as it slowly edges towards its inferior conjunction on the 23rd of September. It will return as a low morning object in October. So if you've never seen the planet Mercury, here's your chance. Uh, Venus. Oh, okay, thank you for that. Um, let me just fix that up quickly. Uh, I think that was Uncle Tony that said that. Thanks, Tony. Um, okay, minimize that. All right. For Venus, uh, August is your last chance to see Venus. After that, it will explode and never exist ever again. Joking. Uh, <laughs> it's just the way it's written here. Um, August is your last chance to see Venus in the constellation Gemini. Before it gets lost in the sun's glare on its way uh, to its October superior conjunction, it can be seen six degrees above the northeastern horizon, half an hour before sunrise, as a minus 3.9 magnitude, 10 arc seconds, f almost fully lit disk. As we move further into August, it is eventually lost in the sun's glare and won't be back until November. Uh, Earth. Uh, as the length of daylight increases, we are moving towards the equinox at 11 a.m. Australian Eastern Time on the 23rd of September. If you have access to a dark sky site, don't forget to observe the zodiacal light. Mars. Mars in the constellation Aries rises 90 minutes above midnight in early August in the northeast, sitting very close to Uranus. As the red planet inches closer to Earth, its magnitude will brighten from 0.2 to minus 0.1 by the end of August. It will be in Taurus just to the west of Hydes, two hours before sunset, 25 degrees above the northeastern horizon before twilight sets in. Through a telescope, it will appear as a ruddy red 10 arc second disc with some subtle surface features visible. As we move into September, the red planet continues to rise earlier and by the end of September, it can be seen just below the constellation of Orion, uh, with its brightness increasing to negative 0.6 magnitude as a 12 arc second disk. Views will continue to improve as we approach its opposition in December. Jupiter. As Jupiter in, the const as Jupiter in Pisces approaches its opposition, it is one of the highlights of the night skies. Rising two hours before midnight in early August, the gas giant sits high in the sky a few hours after sh shining at a magnitude minus 2.5 as a 45 arc second disk. Make sure you view its equatorial bulge, uh, atmospheric bands and Galilean moons. As we, move into, as, we, as we move into September, Jupiter continues to brighten, reaching opposition on September 27th, uh, when it will shine at a brilliant minus 2.8 magnitude 
uh, as a 50 arc second disc at an altitude of 50 degrees. Jupiter should continue to be a prime target for your telescope as we move into the following months. Saturn is in the constellation of Capricornus. It uh, puts on its best show as it approaches in August 15 opposition uh, at an altitude of 65 degrees above the northern horizon at midnight. It will appear as a 0.2 magnitude 19 arc second disc with a ring span of 42 arc seconds tilted at about 14 degrees towards our line of sight. Any telescope will show its rings, the Cassini division and its largest moon, 8th magnitude Titan. For those with larger telescopes, you should also be able to make out some additional 10th magnitude moons, such as Taith's, Dion and Rhea. Stunning views will continue through September. Uranus. Uranus is sitting just above Mars. Uranus is in Aries, rises in the northeast 90 minutes after midnight in early August, climbing to an altitude of 30 degrees before morning twilight be appears, as it slowly moves towards its early November op opposition. Uranus continues to rise earlier in the night through September, reaching its peak elevation of 35 degrees in the northern skies three hours after midnight. Your telescope should reveal its 5.7 magnitude 3.7 arc second disk. You still have, to have, have a pretty good telescope for that though. Neptune. Sitting between Jupiter and Saturn, Neptune is in Aquarius, rises in the east as the skies darken in August, climbing to high altitudes above 50 degrees an hour after midnight. September will offer the best views for Neptune, uh, reaches, uh, uh, reaching op opposition on the 17th of August. To find Neptune around its opposition, start, start at Jupiter and then move an angular distance of around 10 degrees to the west, left. Through a moderately sized telescope, you should be able to make out its 7.8 magnitude, 2.3 arc second bluish disk. You'll, however, need relatively dark viewing conditions to see it. Uh, dwarf planets, i.e. Pluto. Uh, whilst past its July opposition, Pluto can still be observed in Sagittarius at favourable latitudes in August before midnight, with it sitting high in the northeastern sky. As the nights set in, you should be able to make out its 14.4 magnitude 0.1 arc second disk at a dark sky site with a decent aperture 8 inch or preferably higher. Uh, telescope size telescope. Uh, use the finder charts uh, to help you to find Pluto. Uh, yep, okay. I think I'll leave it at that. And just having a look at comments here. What's he saying about comments? I've got a, an article about comments coming up. So, um, Trying to see any, anything particularly here. I don't think there is anything. No. Yeah, uh, visible comments uh, for this month. There is a comment that's around, <laughs> not square. Uh, comment K2 Panstars. Comment C slash 2017. K2 Panstars is an ought cloud comet with an inbound hyperbolic orbit. It was discovered May 2017 at a distance beyond the orbit of Saturn. It was 16 astronomical units or 2.4 billion kilometers from the Sun. Astronomers had never seen an active inbound comet this far out. In August and September the comet will continue to brighten and it will be found in the evening sky at magnitude 8.5. So there is a comet in the sky. All right, okay. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3, Echo Kilo Hotel, 20 past the hour. And still continuing with the magazine, ASV Magazine. 
I just want to give a bit of a rundown on a, an a event that's coming up. Um, all right. <clears throat> sea Lake to host inaugural three-day Astro Festival. Just a quick rundown of what's happening in the next month or so. Uh, one of Australia's largest gatherings of amateur astronomers will converge on Sea Lake for an inaugural three-day Astro Fest hosted by the Astronomical Society of Victoria from the 29th to the 31st of October 2022. In case you don't know where Sea Lake is, it's about four hours from Melbourne, uh, heading in the general direction of uh, um, Mildura. It's up there in the upper northeast part of, uh, of Victoria. Uh, the festival not only includes stargazing from spectacular Lake Tyrol, Victoria's largest salt lake, which boasts star-studded night skies considered to be among the darkest in the country. But exciting daytime activities suitable for the whole family and for all ages will also be on offer too. Coinciding with the Melbourne Cup long weekend, three public viewing nights are offered to members uh, of the public and are invited to book in to, the, to be part of this all-star event. Led by the Astronomical Society of Victoria, this initiative is promoted in partnership with the local Sea Lake community and the Bolloc Shire Council. Lake Tyrell is extremely popular with photographers, astrophotographers and astronomers alike because of its mirror-like surface, ASV's President Mark Oscario said. On calm, cloudless nights, stars seem to come up from the ground, making a for a jaw-dropping sight. You'll be able to see galaxies, nebula and star clusters under the pristine skies of Lake Tyrell. Saturn will be visible high above the northern horizon and Jupiter visible high above the northeastern horizon. There will be two sessions for the kids to enjoy all things science, which includes telescope making, said Mark. There will also be, there will also be special telescopes set up to view the magnificence of the sun. You will be able to see sunspots and solar flares safely. The Sea Lake Hotel will also host an exciting trivia afternoon between 2 and 4 on Monday. Some of Australia's leading astrophysicists will deliver keynote speeches on the Sky Mirror Galaxy, sorry, <laughs> on the Sky Mirror Gallery uh, on Saturday and evening Sunday evenings. You'll also get the chance to be shown the tricks of the trade of nightscape photography by some of Australia's best nightscape photographers, Mark added. These sessions will take place at Sea Lake Art Silo on Sunday and uh, Nul Awa Art Silo on Monday. Nul A Wool. Nul A N U L L A W I L. Nul A Wool Art Silo. On Sunday night, you'll also get a chance to discuss the cosmos with some of the country's leading astrophysicists while you work your way through a delicious three course meal at the Duke. Mark encourages members of the public to visit www.clakeastro.asv.org.au slash program to book sessions that they'll be interested in quickly, uh, be interested in as quickly as possible. Our members are very excited and will we've had a lot of interest in this event from Interstate 2. After two years of lockdowns, people who are very keen to get out in nature and start exploring the cosmos again. Astronomy is for everyone. It doesn't matter if you own a telescope or not. If you're keen on learning more about the night sky, then uh, we'd love to have you involved. Uh, learn more about the 2022 Sea Lake Astro Fest by visiting www.sealakeastro.asv.org.au. That's all one word there, Sea Lake Astro. See Lake Astro. Uh, dot asv. Dot org. Dot au. There's also, uh, if you go to the ASV homepage, you'll also see information about that there too. Sea Lake Astro Fest uh, and how to, to book for uh, going up there. So that's happening. Unfortunately, I, I won't be there. It's too far away for me. So uh, I shan't be going. But I know uh, I, I know that there was there will be a, a radio astronomy demonstration occurring. Uh, uh, Phil Costigan uh, is our new section director for radio astronomy, 
and I know he's actively involved with a, a few other members to to set up a d- display table and uh, demonstrate a little bit of simple radio astronomy up there as well. So, um, yeah, it should be a very interesting weekend for uh, the p- folks involved with the uh, Seascape um, Salt Lake thing. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ. Uh, all right, there's only one person who's uh, sent an email so far. Where is everyone? <laughs> um, we've got Martin, VK7JAH up there on Discord. So it's a little bit of a quiet start, I can see. Uh, never mind. All right. Um, where's my mouse? There, okay. Uh, I did manage to finish off some of these important dates uh, for uh, August. So I'll, uh, it's the 19th, so I'll, I'll start off with the 19th here. Uh, on the 19th of August, 1960, two dogs, Belka and Sterilkia, Sterilkia are launched aboard Sputnik 5 USSR and successfully returned to Earth. Also on the 19th of August, 1646, is the birth first astronomer royal John Flamsteed, who catalogued 3,000 stars. That was in 1646, John Flamsteed. On the 20th of August, 1975, was the launch of Viking 1, first probe to land on and study Mars. Also on the 20th of August, 1977, Voyager 2 launched to the planets to the outer of the outer solar system. On the 22nd of August, 1989, Voyager 2 discovers positive evidence of rings around Neptune. On the 24th of August, 2006, first formal identification of a planet is debated and vote upon by International Astro- Astronomical Union in Prague, resulting in dwarf planet status for Pluto. That was 2006. On the 25th of August 1609, Galileo demonstrates to the Venetian Dodge, Dog, uh, and officials his improved version of a newly invented telescope. And finally, on the 31st of August 1913, British, sorry, birth of famous British radio astronomer Bernard Lovell. That's a love way, that's a great twin, that one on. Was a bit of radio astronomy there. All right, uh, you're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 EKH. Now, this one here has lots of images in it. So I am going to be bringing up uh, a lot of images. They're, they're postcards, pictures of postcards dealing with comets. So uh, let me get into this one because I, I just don't know how long this will take to go through, to be honest. All right. Um, postcards from the Oort Cloud, it's titled, Sending Comets, comets Through the Mail. Postcards were once the social media of choice, and great comets have been among their favourite subjects. So, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, postcards were the social medium of choice. The period between 1907 and 1915 is now known as the golden age of postcards. At its peak, it is estimated that the U.S. Postal Service mailed out over a billion one-penny postcards each year, many of which were printed in colour. Often these postcards had astronomical themes, such as great observations of photographs or photographs of deep sky and solar system objects, including comets. So I shall bring up this first image. And, okay, there it is there. And this, this what you're seeing on the screen right now, is this, this is a rare postcard which shows the Great Comet of 1901 above the skies of Lima in Peru. So there it is, the Great Comet of 1901 above the skies of Lima. 
uh, in the late 19th century. Yes, I've just read all that out. Sorry. <laughs> Next one. Yep. Early beginnings. Uh, patriotic covers were an earlier, early, uh, yeah, early predecessor of modern postcard. Uh, these were often posted during times of war. Uh, at the beginning of the Civil War, the Great Comet of 1861, or C slash 1861 J1, also called the War Comet. And I'll bring up that image now. Um, let me get my mouse onto it. Alright, this is the one we're talking about right now. Uh, the Great Comet of 1861, called the War Comet, blazed across the skies. At its peak, it had a magnitude between 0 and minus 2, and the tail shaped 90 degrees, or spanned, sorry, 90 degrees, inspiring the production of a bizarre postal cover of a comet with the, le le with the head of the General Winfield Scott. Uh, another version, uh, another version had Abraham Lincoln on it. So you can actually see, like they've got a picture of the comet there, but instead of <laughs> the the Astus has taken um, liberty with, um, pardon the pun, uh, with the president of the time. So uh, as you do, I guess. So uh, in reference to the war comet, this 1861 postal cover depicts General Winfield Scott as the head of the comet, that's what you're seeing there. By the late 1890s, millions of postcards featuring drawings and photographs, many in colour, were produced every year. One of these new picture postcards featured the Great Comet of 1901, also called Comet Viscara. Through prim primary a Southern Hemisphere object, colour postcards helped give it worldwide appeal. Comet C slash 1908 R1 Morehouse in 1908 was was featured next. And I'll just bring up that picture. All right. Uh, yes, was um, featured next. <sighs> Sometimes, oh yeah, but the real show came in 1910 when two great comets blazed across the skies. The first was C1910A1, or the Great January Comet of 1910, sometimes referred to as the Daylight Comet. Locally discovered on Jan 12, it quickly became a naked eye object by Jan 17. Uh, was visible in daylight at magnitude minus 5 brighter than the planet Venus and that's 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 some comment it's it sported a broad 50 degree tail and uh, a few beautiful postcards were produced but were quickly overshadowed by the return of Halley's Comet so there is uh, this is the one on the screen right now is the great January Comet vowed the world in early uh, 1910, setting the stage for Halley's stunning return. Through the tail. Let's bring up the next image. Through the tail. By far the most famous of all comets is 1P slash Halley. Has been observed continuously since the year 240 BC. Based on its roughly 76-year period, its return in spring of 1910 was predicted to be an especially good one. The sudden appearance of the great January comet several months before Halley's Perthelion on April 20 certainly helped to fire up the public's expectations. For thousands of centuries, comets have been seen as a hair-binger of change, Harring Binger, Binger, or whatever. So perhaps it's big. It's a big no, no surprise that Halley's Comet was used to promote Teddy Roosevelt's Progressive Party ticket. Uh, American politics always getting into it. So, <laughs> so there it is on the screen there, um, referred to as our own comet, as Americans would. Everyone capitalized on comet mania in 1910 including Teddy Roosevelt's. At one 
at one point the Haley, uh, the Haley shone brighter than magnitude zero. Some reports put it at magnitude minus 3.5 and its tail stretched more than 120 degrees across the sky. Its orbit took close to our planet uh, by 0.15 astronomical unit. Uh, one astronomical unit being, of course, the distance between the Sun and the Earth. On May 19, Earth would have even passed through its tail. And there's another image here. Uh, right. So, this particular postcard you're looking at here, <coughs> this is the German postcard, shows how during 1910 apparition, uh, Halley's Comet swept past Earth and our planet passed through the comet's tail. So, this uh, drawing, uh, um, uh, yeah, drawing shows you the how the how the tail of the comet um, went through the Earth's path. So there, there would have been some interesting, possibly interesting increase in uh, meteorites too, quite possibly. It would be nice to have that happen again. Uh, all right. So continuing on, the deadly gas cyanogen cyanogen uh, had just been discovered in the tail. And the passage led to worldwide panic. The famous French astronomer Camille, Camille, Camille Flammarion added fuel to the panic when the New York Times published his prediction that the cyanogen gas would impregnate the atmosphere and possibly snuff out all life on the planet. The truth was that the Halley's cyanogen uh, was far too rarefied to be remotely a real threat, but the panic still took hold. This led to products like comet pills and comet insurance and anti-comet umbrellas and, of course, bizarre panic postcards. Of the note, of note is the French um, um, produced series of strangely amusing cards depicting humanity desperately trying to evacuate the planet. <laughs> On the other hand, German postcards of the event were purely whimsical in nature. And this is the next card here. Uh, where are we? This one here. So, um, yeah, so as you can see, uh, Comet Mania lasted throughout the 1910s. 1910s, <laughs> uh, with these ethereal objects appearing on holiday, greeting and evening advertising cards. Uh, calm before the storm. Over the, the next several decades, a series of brilliant comets graced the skies, uh, though none inspired the same sort of comet mania seen in 1910. That all changed March 7, 1973, when Lubos Kahutek discovered a distant long period object, comet, uh, as a first time visitor to the inner solar system, comet C 1973 E1 Kahutek was predicted to become the, the comet of the century, revealing or rivaling the planet Venus uh, during Christmas 1973. But it failed to brighten as predicted and was considered a bust. It did become a naked eye object with a tail 25 degrees long, but never lived up to all the media hype. Still, several large observatories and even Skylab 4 took impressive images of the comet, which soon featured on postcards and covers. And this is the image of that comet. Uh, where are we? Where are you? There it is. Come on, go across. Uh, hang on a sec. Let me get it there. Right, there it is. So... Yep, yeah, okay. So, although it never... Although it never lived up to expectations, Comet Kahootek was still memorised on many, memorialised on many postcards. Halley's return. Unlike its appearance in 1910, 
Haley's next apparition in 1986 uh, was its least favourable in more than 2,000 years of observation. This time, instead of Earth passing through its tail, the comet passed at a distance of 0.42 AU, barely reaching two magnitude with a short fan-shaped tail. Haley was a pale glimmer of its former glory. But the media hype was incredible. Dozens of countries produced hundreds of stamps, postcards and covers and other memorabilia commemorating the comet's passage, as well as the small flotilla of spacecraft en route to collect data from this visitor from the outer solar system. Even today, it is easy to find a broad selection of post space postage stamps, first day covers and postcards, most at affordable prices. And here's another image of that to look at in respect to that. But nevertheless, times are a-changing. The 20th century went out with a bang as two impressive comets, C-1996 or Kyokutaik and C-1995-01, uh, Hale-Bob, uh, took turns lightening up the northern skies. Hale-Bob was magnitude zero or brighter for many weeks visible even from the heart of large cities. It was likely that the most widely observed comet in history. But by this time, postcards were no longer a medium of choice. So compared to Halley's Comet, relatively few postcards and covers were produced to commemorate its passage. Today, hang on, let me just uh, get off this for, for picture for, for a sec. Uh, come back to me. There we go. Um, so today, online social media platforms have long since overtaken letters and postcards as primary means of keeping in touch. After a major astronomical event such as an eclipse or bright comet image released from the James Space Webb Telescope, thousands if not millions of images and posts pop up online in span of a few hours. But old postcards and covers have a special charm of their own and true collectors believe that they won't be easy re replaced in the hustle of the digital age. You're tuned to ASV Radio VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. And still talking about comets, uh, Donald Machholz, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, Donald Mac Machholz, a Comet Hunter and co-inventor of the Messier Marathon, dies at the age of 69. Soft-spoken with an encyclopedic knowledge of the solar system's small bodies, Macholtz, Macholtz regularly scoured the heavens for most of his life. And I've got a picture of this fellow. Uh, there it is. Okay, that's Donald. And what they say here is that Donald, or Don, Marchholz, an amateur astronomer who co-invented the Messier Marathon and visually discovered 12 comets that now bear his name, died earlier yesterday morning, that's August 9, at his home called Stargazer Ranch in Arizona. He was 69 years old. Born in 1952 in Portsmouth, Virginia, uh, Donald developed his interest in astronomy at the age of eight. By age 13, he started exploring the sky with his telescope, with his first telescope, a modest two-inch refractor. Beginning Jan 1, 1975, Donald kicked off a personal comet hunting project. After more than three years and... 1700 hours at the eyepiece he discovered his first comet on September 12 1978 his second kind uh, sorry his second find likewise took about 1700 hours of searching and over the next several decades Donald went on to visibly discover 10 more comets that were later named after him in the years leading up to his death 
Donald was considered the most prolific visual comet discoverer alive. Over the course of his life, he spent a total of nearly 9,000 hours scanning the heavens for tail-toting cosmic relics visiting the solar system. Something I wouldn't mind trying to do myself. I wouldn't mind getting a comet named after me. I think that would be rather cool. So, in addition to this unparalleled dedication to seeking out new comets, Donald is also credited with co-inventing the Messier Marathon in 1978. The Messier Marathon is one night race to observe all 109 objects compiled by French comet hunter Charles Messier during the late 18th century. And now the marathon is a spring stable for amateur astronomers across the world. Over the course of four decades, Donald completed 50 Messier marathons. From 1978 until 2000, Donald produced a monthly column called Comet Comets for the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. This popular column was then distributed to astronomy clubs and interested individuals across the world. Donald was also the author of several astronomical publications popular with amateur observers, including A Decade of Comets, 1985, An Observing Guide to Comet Hale Bob, 1996, and The Observing Guide to the Messier Marathon, 2002. Don may have finally completed the marathon of life, but his contributions to the world of astronomy will long live on. So, good on you, Donald. So, being an amateur astronomer can be very rewarding one way or another. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from VK3CSJ in Narrewarren South. This is a short little article. Let me see, there's a picture associated with this too. I'll bring that right up. Okay. Um, must see cosmic objects, the Carina Nebula. Oh, it's not on. Oh, yeah, that should be there. Oh, there it is. Yeah, my uh, TV was updating slowly. Um, <laughs> all right. Isn't that a beautiful thing to look at? That's right over our heads as we speak. Well, almost. Uh, The Orion Nebula may be the best-known mission nebula. It loses, but it loses to the Carina Nebula, NGC 3372, at the most spectacular. Measuring two degrees across, the Carina Nebula looks like an ethereal orchid blossoming with many dark rifts dividing it into several distinct petals. Residing about 7,500 to 8,500 light years from Earth, the Carina Nebula lies within its namesake constellation Carina the Keel. Its southern location, declination minus 60 degrees, keeps it below the southern horizon for observers north of about latitude 30 degrees, but those who can see it are, are treated to a great show. Small binoculars are all you need to begin unlocking this amazing object's complexities. Many stars dot Carina Nebula. Centrally located is the Trumpler 16, one of the three associated open clusters. Trumpler 16 contains some of the most luminous stars in our galaxy, including its most famous member, the remarkable star Eta Carina. Carinae. A binary... ETA's total energy output is some 4 million times that of the Sun. When Edmund Halley first noted ETA's appearance in 1677, it shone at fourth magnitude. By 1730, it had increased to second magnitude, but fell back to fourth magnitude over the next half century. It generally fluctuated, 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 upward until 1843 when it it unexpectedly hit magnitude minus 0.8. For a brief time that March, it was the second brightest day in the night sky. This so-called great eruption may have been caused by a fierce gravitational tug of war 
that destroyed an unknown third star in the system. That outburst gave birth to the Homunculus Nebula, a small but growing barbell-shaped cloud of gas and dust that today engulfs Eta, 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 absorbing much of the star's light. Another feature within Arena Nebula, Carina Nebula worth exploring is the Keyhole Nebula, a small dark cloud silhouetted in front of the brighter background. Uh, and they didn't have a, a picture of that one, bar, bar, the barbell, but it is, it's, it's amongst all that. All right, that was a short article, one I appreciate. This is VK3EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. Okay, with about nine minutes left to go, uh, there was something else here. Um, let's see, uh, something about Artemis, yeah, that just doesn't seem too long, there's lots of pictures in this one too. All right. Um, Artemis 1 launched scheduled for late August. There was a bit of an article in this in the news just recently. G'day Andrew. <coughs> NASA's new launch mission will set the bias basis of humanity's next leap to Mars. And there's a picture of Artemis on the launch pad. There it is. Um, okay, <clears throat> NASA's attempt at a wet dress rehearsal on June 6, rolling out Artemis 1 moon rocket, which you see there on the screen. In a few short weeks, NASA will be just a bit closer to establishing a long-term presence on the moon, a, fun a foundational step towards sending astronauts to Mars. Uh, shooting for a launch date of August 29, depending on weather, of course, Artemis 1's flight test aims to reach a distant distant retrograde orbit around the moon, clocking approximately 1.3 million miles or 2.1 million kilometres over 42 days. Splashdown is expected to occur October 10 off the coast of San Diego. Artemis 1 is NASA's first integrated test for their deep space exploration system, the Orion spacecraft, the space launch system, rocket and the upgrade ground systems at Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida, where the first flight launch will take place. This mission is uncrewed, uh, but it will inform uh, but it will inform future Artemis missions and help build a foundation of future human expeditions. Orion is specifically designed to support human exploration hundreds of thousands of miles from Earth and the uh, space launch system, SLS, the most powerful rocket in history, uh, is built by far, is built to fly faster and further than any crewed spacecraft has ever flown. NASA plans for uh, NASA plans for Artemis II to be crewed lunar flyby, and for Artemis III to focus on crewed lunar landing mission. Notably, Artemis III will be the first time NASA has landed astronauts on the moon since 1972 and it will be the first time in human history uh, that a, um, uh, a woman and what they refer to as a person of colour will walk on the moon. <laughs> I don't know, I, I, I'm, I'm Americans and their whole problem over there, person of colour, I mean why even say it? Just, 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 it, it just annoys me that they still they, they're trying to be polite person of color they're trying to be polite not to put people get people upset but the fact that they still mention it is is just a sign of the racial issues that that country has they don't even, they don't even need to say that but they still do it just annoys me sorry off the topic um okay <laughs> now next uh, image here is this one and uh, come on, come on, come on, let's go. I know why it does this. Uh, stop. There we go. Uh, so that image there shows a bit of a, a flight plan of sorts um, for, uh, for Artemis 1, if you can follow that. Um, so... Before it can focus on bringing humans back to space, NASA needs to stretch its wings. 
During Artemis One's initial flight, NASA's primary objectives are to test the Orion heat shield when returning through Earth's atmosphere. Evaluate overall operations through the various phases of the mission and test the processes for retrieving the spacecraft after splashdown. <laughs> My internal uh, antenna tuner is having a bit of a hernia, I've just noticed. Uh, all right. Ultimately, NASA wants to confirm all things that the Orion program needs to do to look at the capsule to say, yes, we think we can fly a crew on the next one, said Melissa Jones, Artemis One's recovery director, during a press conference. There's a bit of a video here, which I shall... Why is it doing that? My internal uh, ATU seems to be having a bit of a, a problem. Uh, just hold on a sec, guys. Let me just check something. Uh, um... Yeah, alright, I'm not sure. Uh, something's going on with the linear, I think. My, my signal on uh, 160 metres might be uh, uh, changing a little bit. Anyway, um, where's this video? I'll, I'll run this little video for it. There's no sound associated with it, but it's a bit of animation um, uh, of uh, Artemis 1 launching. Um, Okay. All right. Back to the article. Um, this this due diligence isn't particularly surprising when one considers the extreme conditions Orion will face during its blistering return through Earth's atmosphere. When it enters the atmosphere, the module will be travelling at up to 25,000 miles per hour, or 40,000 kilometres an hour, reaching temperatures around 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit or 2,800 degrees Celsius, faster and hotter than any human carrying spacecraft has come before it. So evaluating the heat shield performance is a critical first step before a crewed Artemis mission can take place. Another key objective as NASA prepares for the future of human space exploration is to understand the risk of high radiation on the human body as well as the basic biological systems. Thus, Artemis 1 will be carrying out biology investigations related to deep space radiation, including studies examining its impact on the nutritional values of seeds, DNA repair of fungi, adaption of yeast, and gene expression of algae. Um, okay. I'll just come back to me on this one. Uh, okay. <sighs> Something's going on with my 160 meter transmission. Um, all right, uh, coming up to the hour. Let's see if I can just skip to the gateway. So, gateway to the solar system, another vital component of Artemis missions, uh, and ultimately the cornerstone of NASA's future for deep space exploration, is the Gateway program based on Johnson's Space Center in Houston. Uh, the program is building the first space station to orbit the moon. And there's a, a bit of a, an artist's impression of that, which is there. Um, Gateway will serve as a multi-purpose outpost enabling human exploration of the lunar surface and serving as a staging point for expeditions reaching far farther into space, made possible through the international and commercial partnerships gateway while will have docking ports for different spacecraft support ongoing scientific research and include the habitation uh, and logistics outpost halo uh, where crew to live and work on board where crew will live and work on board nasa is designing gateway to be a pillar uh, upon which all future deep space exploration is built a true entryway to making a mission to Mars possible. Um, when we think about Artemis, we focus a lot on the moon, but uh, but he's, the author says, I just want everybody to remember, our sights are not set on the moon. Our sights are set clearly on Mars, said Reed Wiseman, chief astronaut at Johnson Space Center during the press event. Wiseman emphasized how... Found, how 
um, foundational the Artemis 1 test flight will be for Artemis 2 and Artemis 3 and beyond. Artemis 3 is leading to the rest of the Artemis program, the first woman, the first person of colour on the surface of the moon and the first humans trekking out to Mars and putting our footsteps and building science laboratories and having access to another planet, Wiseman said. He says, to me, it is just the most awesome, inspiring moment that we have had here at NASA. The future is indeed already underway, with all sites now set on August 29. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. All right, uh, now let's just quickly hit space weather for a second or more or two. Uh, space weather, the solar wind is currently at 550 kilometres a second at a density of 7.7 .7 protons per cubic centimetre. There are four or five, five sunspots, I think, five noticeable sunspots on the, the disk of the sun facing the Earth at the moment, designated as AR 3082, uh, 3081, 84 and 83, I think. A bit hard to read that one. There's a graphic. I can bring up that graphic there. There it is. Um... For some reason, I'm not seeing a signal back from the repeater, but I assume that I'm still getting a picture through the repeater there. Um, all right. Um, geomagnetic storm uh, watch. Don't give up, it says here. The the first two days have, made, have had multiple geomagnetic storms. The result of a CME strike on Earth, 17th, uh, none was as strong as the G3 class event originally forecast, but don't give up. G1 and G2 class storms are still possible August 19, 20 and 21 in response to additional CMEs on the way. High altitude auroras remain likely as we enter the weekend. Um, and there is an image here of a, uh, a solar flare um, or a CME. Uh, happening. Explosions continue in the past 24 hours. Active sunspot AR3078 has produced four M-class solar flares and more than a dozen C flares. Most of the explosions hurtled debris into space. Uh, here, here on what you're seeing right now on TV, um, here's a sample of C-class event at the end of August 18. The blast was bookend book ended by a similar explosions hours earlier and later the um, could this could cause additional grazing of CME impacts here on earth August 20 and to August 21 extending on the uh, uh, the uh, uh, you know you know hitting the uh, geomagnetic activity uh, and the latest shot of our Aurora over the Antarctica uh, or Aurora Australis. So that's the current view of the Aurora as it is at the moment. So it's not, not very active, um, but there is a little bit of uh, uh, Aurora activity as usual. That's nothing to, to uh, carry on about. So on that note, uh, the solar flux I haven't mentioned, the radio flux, uh, the radio sun is currently 117 solar flux units measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimetres. Uh, 117 solar flux units. Right. And uh, as we go down the page, uh, as of August 19, 2022, there are 2,288 potentially hazardous asteroids out there. All very exciting. So there it is. That's the uh, ASV broadcast for tonight, for today, this evening. As I mentioned at the uh, the beginning, um, <coughs> something's going on with my uh, ATU. Um, there won't be any ASV broadcast next uh, next Friday. So uh, we're having the ASV QSO party. Um, 
Peter Cousins, VK3 BFG, and the team behind him, which is pretty much all of us, but anyway, <laughs> there's a small team behind him, are uh, busily engaging in getting stations around Australia to come up on Friday night. And then on Saturday from 10 o'clock, there'll be crosses to America. So uh, courtesy of the internet, of course. Uh, but it looks like it'll be a, a really good uh, good turnout this uh, this time. So um, next Friday and next Saturday, ATV QSO party, which can be viewed via the YouTube stream, which I think Ian VK3 Corbeck Lima you will be putting up. So if you don't have a, a, a capable, uh, if you're not able to see the repeater directly, uh, there will be a stream on YouTube. Uh, all right, so um, this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, broadcasting on 1865 kilohertz. The uh, service there, I will now turn the transmitter off because something's something is upset my uh, my Pro 3. Um, I don't know exactly what's happening, but um, uh, something has uh, gone a bit skew with. So I suspect my signal has uh, changed a little bit on 160. So this is VK3 EKH. There won't be any callback on 160. It'll be done on 80. So standby stations on 80 meters. Uh, this is VK3 EKH with VK3 CSJ on the microphone, concluding our medium wave service on 1865. Uh, thank you for listening. Any stations that have been listening on 160 would appreciate a signal report. Um, just send to VK3. EKH at gmail.com, VK3EKH at gmail.com uh, for any signal reports would be interesting to uh, to see. This is VK3EKH with VK3CSJ on the microphone. Any further information about the society can be, can be gleaned from uh, www.asv.org.au. This is VK3EKH, ASV Radio. Oh, I think my transmitter is going to be very happy. <laughs> I can hear the little fan going for a big whirl at the moment, calling that solid state PA down. I don't know what's gone wrong there. Something's gone a bit skew if. All right. Uh, so we shall now listen on 3541 for any stations wishing to report in. Uh, I think we're all ready to go there. This is VK3 EKH listening on 3541. All right. Now, there were uh, a bit of doubling going on at the beginning. Uh, we've got VK3AWO, VK3HDX, VK7A, uh, VK7J, uh, my bloody writing, VK7JAH. Uh, anybody else? <laughs> Acknowledging VK3KKT. Any other stations? All right, across to you there, Doug, VK3AWO. Good to hear you, mate, VK3EKH. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Good on you. VK3AWO, VK3EKH, uh, returning. Very good to hear you, Doug. Good signal here uh, on 80, of course. And, um, uh, yeah, great great to hear you. So thanks very much for uh, for calling in. Excellent stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, Don, VK3HDX. G'day, mate. VK3EKH. Um, yeah, the 160 uh, metre 
signal stayed up, but it, uh, it did drop down in uh, signal strength. It dropped out for a second and then came back and whatnot. So I assumed it was an antenna issue or Could be. a tuner issue or a bad cable or, or something. But uh, I could hear it um, uh, the whole way through. I mean, it was very strong. Most of the time, it was only towards the end there it started to play up a little bit, mm. but I'm sure you'll, uh, you'll sort that out. But thanks for the broadcast, and uh, we'll look forward to um, a couple of weeks' time, but I'll be watching the OTV uh, QSO Carbon uh, next week. So I watched them last year and uh, enjoyed that. So thank you, and uh, we'll see you again in a couple of weeks with AK3 VK8. And the group, VK3 HDX. Yeah, thanks, Don. VK3 HDX, VK3 KH returning. Very good. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what uh, what's going on there with the... Um, I, I noticed the output from the, the, the linear was uh, dropping too, so... Um, uh, maybe the, the, the linear is protesting a little bit with the, uh, the 100 watts of AM that I'm running. So, <laughs> it's, uh, it's been behaving itself beautifully well for quite... The best part of 12 months uh, but uh, just because i haven't had it turned on for the last two fridays it's decided to uh to protest so um, i hope there's uh, no uh, no damage going on i can't smell anything so i guess everything's all right <laughs> anyway we better investigate what's going on uh a little later on anyway thanks tom and uh yep uh, we'll be back on uh what would that date be um bringing up the calendar uh, 26th the 2nd yeah 2nd of uh, September we'll be back on air here thanks Don uh, Martin VK7JAH in Launceston good evening to you Yeah, okay, Martin, VK7JH, VK3, EKH returning. Yeah, no worries, uh, Martin. So, look, it's not a bad signal, but um, <coughs> it's uh, just a little bit above the noise. Uh, you, I don't know, you've you've never been an exceptionally strong signal up here, but um, uh, still, um, we, we managed to hear most of that uh, uh, over, and uh, thanks for the, uh, the report there. Uh, it doesn't sound like it's... Uh, uh, my signal to you it doesn't sound like it's too bad so um, hopefully I'll, I'll have the um, the other linear running for next week or the week after anyway uh, and um, uh, be back to my uh, my 400 watts but um, no thanks Martin um, good to uh, good to hear you and uh, and of course you're up there on the on the chat window as well not too many people on the chat though it's uh, very limited up there, isn't it? Anyway, um, all right, uh, to Ian, VK5KKT, VK3EKH. Go ahead, uh, Ian. Thanks, Ian. <coughs> VK5, KKT, two worlds, VK3, EKH returning. Very good. Um, yes, you're uh, you're just on the the strength nine here. 
my my noise floor is hovering around S8 to, to uh, S9, and you just sort of just above that. A little bit of QSP brings you you up uh, to about five over. So, uh, but uh, mostly uh, a, a copyable signal, so um, not too bad at all. Uh, thanks again for, for for calling in and uh, and giving us uh, the the report there. Excellent stuff. Uh, all right. Uh, is there any other stations wishing to uh, to check in tonight? VK3 EKH listening. Okay, this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. Thanks everybody for calling in tonight. Uh, much appreciated. And uh, again, thanks uh, very, very much for all the kind uh, uh, e emails that everybody has sent uh, uh, over the last uh, week or so. And um, do appreciate uh, all those comments. Very, uh, very good indeed. Uh, so, like I say, we won't be here next Friday. Thanks, uh, by the way, Andrew, VK3 KIS. He's uh, written an email there. He's uh, just checking in. So, so uh, thanks, Andrew, for uh, for the email. Uh, cheers to uh, John, Mr. VK3, BLX, and Nebs, and Martin, and John again. I think that's all there is up there on the on the Discord channel. Yep, I think there is. That's it. Yep. So this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, concluding transmissions for tonight, um, and we'll be back on the 2nd of uh, September, Friday there. So uh, see if you can uh, find the YouTube channel and uh, look out for the ATV QSO party. Um, and uh, if you are in the Melbourne area, uh, there's uh, an opportunity for you to, to get a set-top box and uh, have a chance to tune in and see if you can um, actually see the repeater. It's, uh, it's, uh, it runs 100 watts, vertically polarised, uh, on 445.5 megahertz DVB-T2, it's a HD uh, transmission, so you, your set-top box must be able to receive DVB-T2 and uh, must be able to manually enter 445.5. Don't use auto-tune, it won't work. It's got, you've got to be able to enter manually enter the frequency of the repeater on 445.5 and of course that will only work if there's a signal running through the, the transmitter, at the, uh, if the TV transmitter is running, the repeater is running. <sighs> Enough of that. This is VK3 EKH with VK3 Charlie Sierra Juliet concluding for tonight. Thank you everybody. This is, uh, this is um, ASV Radio over and out. Cheers everyone. Yeah, thanks, Tony. I'll, <laughs> I'll put you down there, V A T. There we go. All right, thanks, Tony. And uh, how how are you? How are you going? Yeah, no, I know, I know what you're saying, uh, Tony. I, oh, I think, um, I mean, I, I, as you know, you, you know, you know the circumstances. So I've I've been uh, laying pretty low for the, the last uh, few weeks and um, uh, trying to get through uh, uh, all this uh, thing that's been going on. And uh, so I've I've I, you know, playing radio has uh, been a little bit as a secondary thing. Um, and uh, I've I've had the handheld on downstairs a couple of times, and I've I've heard um, uh, Bob and 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 Richard uh, and, and Dennis. Um, I've spoken to them at odd times during the day, um, but uh, uh, certainly I think uh, your your absence has been duly noted too. So <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, I, I think Richard's away this weekend. He's uh, is off uh, out in the bush apparently, uh, so um, hopefully it won't be too cold and, and wet uh, wherever he is. Uh, but uh, I've I'm planning to have one more week off work before I go back. 
So uh, um, hopefully, um, uh, you know, hopefully next week I'll be able to uh, uh, just get, get back into the swing of a few things. I've been having some very late nights uh, lately, uh, getting to bed at about four o'clock uh, in the morning, just haven't been able to sleep very well. So um, uh, I've got to try and get back into some sort of uh, routine, I guess. But uh, there it is. So, uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll just see how it goes. Um, all right. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, lots of changes. Uh, my, my idea about retiring early has uh, pretty much fallen through now. <laughs> uh, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to have to work, continue to work. I'll probably stay working part time, but uh, yeah, there's uh, there's no real point in in me having to uh, to to go into uh, full retirement. I, su- I I suppose I still could, uh, but the only reason why I was going into full time retirement was really for Mum to look after her. So uh, that's all changed now. So uh, um, I'll uh, I think I'll stay on at work for a, a little bit longer for at least maybe another 6 to 12 months and we'll make a uh, another decision at that point and we'll see how we go. But um, there it is. Anyway, all right. I'll, um, I guess we'll leave it at that. No, I'm, I'm still streaming. I need to turn that video YouTube thing off. <laughs> VK3, uh, VAT, VK3 CSJ. Yeah, no worries, Tony. VK3, VAT, VK3, CSJ. Yeah, look, um, I, I know that um, uh, Bob had some problem with his remote link uh, up at Narut, Western Victoria, and um, he, he had to make a trip, uh, the, the three-hour journey, uh, to, uh, to, to pick up his microwave link. There's a little microwave link that he uses for his internet connection that, that had fallen over. So he brought that home, picked it up and brought it home to work on it, basically got it working and took it back last Saturday. Uh, they, uh, him, uh, Bob and Chris uh, took a, a drive and they, Bobby was asking if I'd be interested to come along. Um, and uh, I thought about it, but I look, last Saturday I was still uh, very much in between things and um, plus uh, I would have been backseat driving well not driving but um I, I don't really sit comfortably in a back seat of a car if it's a long if there's a long drive involved uh, I'd, I'd rather be driving or or at least in the passenger seat uh so um uh i mean i probably would have been all right but um uh, at last Saturday, <clears throat> last Saturday, I, would, I think I, I, I said to to Bob, no, no, you, you, you got you guys go down because they were planning on staying overnight. Um, for I think as you know, for me, I, I'm not really, um, I don't know. For me, for I, I, I prefer if if I'm if, if I'm going to go out somewhere into the country, uh, I always like to try and make it a day trip, so I go out and come back. Uh, even if it's one, you know, if, if I come back home at one o'clock in the morning, it's I, I get back home. 
So uh, um, I've never really been terribly keen in staying over uh, in other places unless I have to do it. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, one of those things. But, um, yeah, I think he left uh, pretty early. He was um, uh, out to, to get up to his Nurut location pretty uh, pretty early so that he could get a start. He's, he's now added 160 to his antenna up there at, uh, at his remote station, so he's now able to come up on, on 160 metres, but he still has to do a little bit of fine-tuning on that antenna. Uh, but he has been able to come up on 160, and uh, he's, uh, he's, he's been able to work uh, stations in VK2 and VK4 uh, from his remote station. So things are looking good. Uh, but uh, something has apparently something has fallen over again in the, in the last two days. There's he's got some issue uh, with the system, so he's he's getting RF into things. He needs to work out why that is. So yeah, anyway, um, but I, I've caught up. I, ha- I have caught up with Bob a couple of times and um, uh, been able to catch up with the latest uh, during the day. Uh, but. Uh, yeah, I've I've got lots of things to do down here. I've I've uh, I've had to phone up so many people to to let them know that um, that that mum's passed on and to uh, cancel uh, ongoing appointments, uh, things that were just happening all the time. Uh, speak to the 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 chemist had to to um, uh, speak to the pharmacy in Dandenong to let them know what was going on. Uh, both the telephone. Uh, the telephone bill and the Foxtel bill were in mum's name, taking advantage of uh, pension discount. Uh, so I've had to phone up both Tolstra and uh, Foxtel, which were length- lengthy phone calls, uh, to uh, close one account and start a new account in my name. So little, little things like that um, that, uh, that just spread out across the week. Um and of course, uh, con- I had to contact Centrelink uh, to let them know as well that uh, Mum had passed, which means her pension is now ceased. Uh, her her last pension was this week, and that's it. No more of uh, the, her pension. Uh, the carers' payment that I was trying to organise uh, throughout this year to get rolling um, has well, it's a funny arrangement because when, when I rang up Centrelink. Uh, on Tuesday to, to talk to them um, I wanted to find out what the story was with uh, the carer's payment uh, and the person I spoke to went off to uh, to see his supervisor and uh, after so many minutes on hold they came back and said look we've reinstated your uh, carer's payment and uh, we'll, you'll continue to receive it for the next 14 weeks so, um, which will sort of bring it into November, I think. <clears throat> so, Centrelink's done pretty good, uh, actually. They've, they've, they've extended that payment, um, fortnightly payment, to, to, to uh, 14 weeks, uh, which is a, a nice thing. And there was actually, there was also a bereavement payment that they paid out, paid me too. So, um, a bereavement payment. And uh, that it wasn't too bad actually, so <laughs> so um, anyway, Centrelink actually came through for me pretty well. Um, if they had have closed the the uh, carer's payment uh, in this week, the same week as as Mum's pension, uh, I I I would have uh, been only relying on the fortnightly pay from work, which was it's just over a grand a fortnight, so. Um, you know, it would have been interesting to see how I could have survived on that. <laughs> but uh, fortunately, things uh, have sort of come through okay in more ways than one. And uh, I've spoken to the people at Australian Super and, and they've also come to my party. So uh, I think financially, things are not too bad at the moment, more or less. Anyway, all right, um, enough of that. Uh, we'll... Uh, We'll leave it with that, I think, at this stage. Um, but that, that brings you pretty much all up to date, one way or another, I think. <laughs> VK3 VAT, VK3 CSJ.
Good on you, Tony. Thanks, mate. Um, no worries. Yeah, look, um, <clears throat> I'll, uh, I'll I'll be slowly getting back on deck uh, over the next uh, couple of weeks, and the ATV QSO party should be a, a nice little, um, uh, yeah, um, reintrodu- intro- reintroduction into the world of TV. <laughs> It's a funny thing to say. Anyway, <laughs> all right, mate. Cheers, Tony. Take care. Have a good night, and uh, we'll probably we'll may catch you over the weekend, perhaps. VK three VAT VK three CSJ clear on eighty meters. See you, Tony. All right. This is uh, VK three CSJ. On the Melbourne Television Repeater, VK3RTV1, concluding for tonight, I think. We'll make that a, a final, final. And uh, for everybody who's watching on the YouTube channel, thank you for watching. Um, and uh, we'll be back in two weeks' time. Uh, but the, again, like I say, there's the ATV QSO party next Friday and Saturday. So it should be an exciting couple of days for uh, us ATVers. So on that note, the picture up there looks pretty good, what I'm seeing off the repeater. Uh, for those that might be watching ATV, um, I, I'm using a different set-top box tonight. Um, I don't know if I can get it on camera. Um, oh, actually, I can use, use the USB camera. Um, I'll just bring up the USB camera. And um, although I, I can see how the USB camera is doing a flicker. There's the uh, the new set top box I'm experimenting with. It's a uh, GT Media. Um, this uh, device here. But what I the reason why I got it was because it has F connectors on the back, so I can f- have the antenna from. To receive the repeater going straight into an F connector, and there's an and that of course is DVBS uh, for 23 centimeters there, um, and you can see it's this that's what's available on the back, and uh, yeah, so that's it. Um, courtesy of AliExpress. Um, and it's got Wi-Fi in it, so I've got uh, it connected to my router, or modem, I should say, downstairs. And um, seems to work okay. It uh, produces a really interesting image up on the screen there, of course. <laughs> um, and it has. Um, oh, it also comes with this thing too. Uh, to be honest. It's a fancy remote control, but well, the, this is the remote control for it, uh, for the uh, thing. So that's st- stock standard GT Media uh, remote control. But the the thing came with this this funny device, and uh, I, I'm not quite sure why. <laughs> um, I've yet to work out exactly what to, what this is uh, really useful for. So. Um, Anyway, there it is, and uh, um, I'll bring up the signal reporting thing. If you hit, click on info, there's the uh, the signal reporting information up on the screen there. I'm trying to get that light out of the way, it's a bit hard. Um, but you can see the signal that I'm getting, 95%, 95%, that's uh, rather interesting uh, what's uh, available there. Still, it would be good if it had, uh, um, if it had um, um, Constellation on it, I always wish it had Constellation capabilities. But uh, anyway, that's, that's what I'm playing with at the moment, it seems to, uh, to work quite well. Um, off, uh, I think it was AliExpress. So enough of that rubbish. Um, uh, so the ne- next thing I uh, I hope to be able to get is a DVB-T transmitter. Uh, DVB-T2, no, just T, DVB-T for our 
uplink when that gets going that's it for me for tonight I'm going downstairs to watch some more House of Cards it's a I love that series with the Kevin Spacey it's been a, a probably a, a good couple of years since the last time I watched it but we're watching it on what is it Netflix House of Cards love it sort of stuff um All right, we'll leave it at that. This is ASV Radio. No, it's not ASV Radio. It's gone finished. VK3CSJ. Uh, going to colour bars. So, uh, everybody, thank you for watching. And, uh, oh, yes, we'll be doing the um, WIA broadcast this Sunday morning if the repeater is running. <laughs> uh, we'll do the, the broadcast, WIA broadcast, Sunday morning at 10.30. Um, and then we'll repeat that at 8 o'clock. Sunday night if everything is kosher and then Tuesday is the ASV uh, not ASV the ATV net Tuesday night at uh, kicking off at 8 o'clock hosted by Neil VK3 BCU and uh, which will then precursor into that's the right word precursor anyway into our ATV QSO party next week that's it, I'm out of here. Cheers everyone, take care. Bye for now, VK3CSJ.